Coming up on DTNS, it's TSMC versus Huawei as the China-U.S. trade war heats up in the tech sector. Which Apple AR headset is most credible? And Facebook buys Giphy. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 15th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralt. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were talking about old cars and old commercials on Good Day <laughs> Internet today. If you want to get that conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Netflix is starting to lift European coronavirus-related streaming quality limits in Denmark, Norway, and Germany. This was first reported by Flat Panels HD. Previously, Netflix, Apple TV+, Plus, and Amazon Prime Video all compiled with European Commission requests back in March to reduce bandwidth and help networks manage their loads. Apple restored 4K streaming late last month. Munich, Germany announced it will use open source software for administration needs. The city government also committed to making source code of all city software public as long as no confidential or personal data is involved. Munich began moving away from proprietary software back in 2006, but in 2017 moved toward proprietary software again. The new swing back to open source will happen slowly as contracts come up for renewal. Foxconn reported its net income declined 89% in Q1 to $70 million. Overall revenue for the company declined 12% on the year to $31.02 billion. Foxconn thinks it stabilized everything in Q2, though. Uh, remember, they were in China with the pandemic hitting in Q1, unlike uh, most of the rest of the world, which really didn't get hit till March. So they're projecting double-digit percentage growth for Q2 over Q1, although likely still down on the year. Next quarter, enterprise is expected to grow 10%, computing units 15%, and consumer electronics, which has phones in it, falling by 15%. Foxconn did note that all its main factories in China have now resumed normal operations. Microsoft published threat intelligence data related to COVID-19 themed attacks on GitHub. This data comes from trillions of signals each day seen across identities, endpoint, cloud, applications, and email by Microsoft, and has already rolled out into Microsoft solutions like Microsoft Threat Protection and Azure Sentinel. Microsoft also provided attack indicators to raise in, uh, awareness of attack uh, attackers' shift on techniques, how to spot them, and how to enable custom detection. NVIDIA launched Clara Guardian, an edge AI system designed for hospitals. Using sensors, the system can check people for elevated temperatures, use computer vision analysis to monitor for social distancing, and do contactless patient monitoring. The system will use NVIDIA's EGX Edge AI chips, available in late 2020, and is currently in test development in 50 hospitals across China, France, Italy, and Israel, covering 10,000 hospital rooms. And Facebook announced its Messenger Rooms group chat feature now available to all users across mobile and desktop. Messenger Rooms lets up to 50 participants chat with no time limit. Rooms can be used under the People tab in the Messenger app or from the top of the main Facebook news feed. And users can specify who can join, even letting non-Facebook users join the calls. All right, let's talk a little bit more about something else Facebook did, Sarah. Oh, let's. Facebook has acquired GIF making and sharing site Giphy. You might call it Jiffy, and that's fine, but that's what it acquired, and put it under the Instagram organization. Giphy has already integrated into Instagram, Facebook, Messenger, and WhatsApp, as well as several third-party services that you might use. Facebook says 50% of Giphy's traffic comes from Facebook properties, though. Instagram's VP of product, Vishal Sa, says that Giphy's API partners will continue to have the same access to Giphy's APIs, and the, and the community can still create GIFs there. So, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> Unless, All right, so the, 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 unless gifts are, you know, getting pulled away from something that you really use it for, is this really a big deal? Because man, it's being called as a really big acquisition. Right. Yeah, the the knee jerk reaction in any acquisition is, oh, they're going to ruin my favorite thing, right? And with Facebook these days, people just immediately assume evil intentions, uh, whether it's it's called for or not. Facebook's saying all the right things, though, right? They're saying we're going to continue to, to leave it operating as it is. Uh, it already is integrated in all their products. They're, they're going to try to find new and cooler ways to integrate it. But other than, you know, maybe being critical of Facebook 
getting bigger and owning another piece of the internet. Uh, I, I, I don't know that they've said anything that, that warrants criticism right away. As long as I get to keep my rock slow capping while hard chewing gum, <laughs> if I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I actually really thought, where do I use this? It's almost exclusively on Facebook, on Instagram time. You mentioned, you know, earlier that uh, you use it on Twitter, Yeah, yeah. but um, it, it's true. I do use it mostly with Facebook properties. So as long as they are not going to snatch stuff away, I think that uh, people are going to be upset right now, but uh, you know, after time they won't care because they still use it like they've always used it. I mean, a lot of this, you know, people going like, Giphy, isn't it like sort of fun animated GIFs? Well, yeah, in many ways it is. And then I've also seen, especially from, you know, particular news outlets today, like, well, Facebook's taken over your keyboard now. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> and it's sort of like, is this really the acquisition that would make us say this? Yeah, I don't consider Giphy as an integral part of my keyboard. I, I, I guess... Uh, there are plenty of of situations where you you've got uh, GIF integration if you've you've got the Giphy app in iOS or or Android integrated. Uh, but how many Facebook things are also integrated with the keyboard somehow? Like they're just there's right. there's legitimate criticisms of Facebook and a legitimate criticism to be made that Facebook maybe uh, is is holding too much power over certain activities on the internet and maybe Giphy deserves some antitrust investigation, uh, which sounds hilarious uh, in in retrospect. But but I don't think that Facebook owning Giphy means they now control. I don't, I don't know. There's a line there, and it, and and it doesn't have to be a bad thing, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. 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 So analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says Apple plans to launch a 10.8-inch iPad in the first half of 2020 and an 8.5 to 9-inch iPad mini in the second half of 2020. Kuo also says tablets will have a low price point with up-to-date chips. Kuo also said that Apple's upcoming AR glasses will launch in 2022 at the earliest. However, YouTuber John Prosser claims that they will launch in March to June timeframe of 2021. They actually both could be right, as the information says Apple is working on an AR headset for 2022 and an AR glasses set for 2023. All right, let's talk about augmented reality. Uh, first of all, I, <laughs> I I like the idea that we might be getting close to finally seeing what they've been working on. They've hired enough people. They, they just acquired Next VR this week. Yeah. yeah, so you know they're working on something, uh, and I'm very interested to see what it is. But I'm also uh, kind of interested in industry veteran Longtime proven credible analyst whose predictions generally are spot on. Ming Chi Kuo going up against the young up and comer YouTuber John Prosser uh, over the <laughs> date of the AR glasses. Uh, we will check back in March to June 2021 <laughs> to see who will win this epic fight. Well, the thing is that uh, so so Kuo is is very, very like he understands the supply chain and what might be, you know, on on par delayed, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, brought to the forefront kind of thing like no other. However, John Prosser also says, I've seen these air glasses. Mm. I've tried out at least a prototype and I like them. The plot Semantically, thickens. they're both going to be right, I'm assuming. <laughs> they're both going to be right. Something's going to come out um, shortly. Something's going to come out shortly after that. And they're both going to be mm -hmm. able to say, see, I was right. So, um, <laughs> I am kind of excited to see what they're doing um, with AR. Um, but also at the beginning of the story was, uh, you know, the, the the inexpensive iPads. I'm excited to see those because, you know, we were talking about this a little earlier. Um, I believe that school, um, you know, is going to be different um, in the fall than it's mm -hmm. ever been. So there's going to be a lot of remote learning. And these are devices that you probably can relatively easily get into the hands of, uh, of school children to allow them to do their online learning. Because I think even if they are going to class, it's just going to be a level of disruption that we haven't seen where they're going to be doing a lot of work at home, maybe going, you know, every other day or something like that. And, you know, you know one day work from home, one day work, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the classroom. So I think that these inexpensive iPads are going to go a long way to enabling those kind of efforts. Yeah, Quo saying that uh, they will take the same approach as the iPhone SE makes sense. Uh, upgrade the chips, uh, but maybe keep the form factors uh, simpler. Uh, these will be larger versions of affordable iPads. I think uh, the 10.1 inch at $329 is maybe the, the cheapest one. I know $329 is the cheapest one they have. Uh, so will we see a $299 
iPad uh, between 8.5 uh, to, to 9 inches there. Uh, it would be the largest iPad mini at 8.5 to 9 inches, I think, uh, that they have done. So, uh, yeah, I think you're right. That's that. It may not be as splashy and flashy as an AR rumor, uh, but but it is the, the more impactful if, if you've got affordable iPads out there when more and more kids need access to that and, and schools, too. In a post on the Chromium blog, Google announced it plans to block ads that use up to too many system resources. Google said this would impact 0.3% of ads that use 27% of network data taken by ads and 28% of CPU usage. Chrome would set a limit of four megabits of network data or 15 seconds of CPU usage in any 30 second period going forward or 60 seconds of total CPU usage and ads over that limit would show an error message advising that the user was seeing that because the ad is not showing because it was taking up too much space. The Chrome team will experiment with these features in the next few months uh, with a uh, plan to launch it in the stable Chrome channel in August. Man, yeah. Uh, I don't imagine anybody who isn't trying to do crypto mining in an ad is going to complain about this. Uh, I mean, 0.3% of ads using 27% of network That's data. That's crazy. Uh, yes, at 28% of CPU usage. I mean, how many times have you had your browser running and, and it just it starts, you know, the fan starts blowing and you're like, what is that? Uh, and you turn off scripts and suddenly it goes away. Like ads on their own, even legitimate ads uh, build up those processes. And if you've got something that's, that's just taking over way more resources, either through incompetence because it's just programmed badly uh, or maliciousness, uh, I don't think there's anybody who's going to say, I, I don't want that to go away, right? Yeah, Google knows that bad ads keep people from clicking on good ads that they're generally not bothered by. So if you've got an ad that's going to crash your system, the next ad that actually may have been something that was beneficial to you that you may have clicked on, you're just going to have an aversion to doing it. So this makes sense, business sense for them to get that gook out of their system so that they can continue to make money for every click on the ones that meet their criteria. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and also, <laughs> Sarah, as you were saying, uh, having a big, big blank uh, space in the middle that that uh, had some Laura Mipson kind of text in the example they showed on Venture.com uh, that I saw. But uh, but just saying like, hey, this ad was eating up your system resources. Yeah. They, they like, can you imagine anymore. as a user being like, bummer, I really wanted it. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's good to sort of know, I suppose. But, you know, when people are trying to bypass ads left and right, for the most part, it seems like this is a call to, you know, whoever's making ads, bring down that data or, you know, you're going to get you're going to bounce out of here. Yeah. All right. Some people may stay working from home. We talked earlier this week about Twitter uh, saying that their folk can just stay working from home indefinitely unless they have a job that requires them to be on location. A Gartner survey back in April found that 74 percent of company CFOs expect at least some of their employees to remain permanent remote workers, even after there's a vaccine for COVID-19. Wired reports uh, some anecdotes box saying that they've found their engineers push releases quicker working from home in their case, and that reaching customers has been easier because you don't have to fly to meet them. You just call them up on a video conference. A startup called Cul-de-Sac has already given up its $25,000 a month San Francisco office space because they thought their workers became happier and more productive working from home. Not all companies are going to be able to take advantage of this. Apple is a very big example of having some security policies that mean they can't get a lot of things done and keep the security policy, especially when it comes to building hardware. Uh, so they are already planning to bring people back into the office later this month. If you do have to go back in the office, too, it's going to be different. Uh, according to a survey from commercial real estate company CBRE, expect social distancing easily. 80% uh, of the people they surveyed are going to do that. Uh, there will probably be some kind of face covering policy, whether it's you have to have it on all the time or certain situations. Uh, certainly, there will be restrictions on visitors. Uh, visitors may be banned entirely or, or just limited. Uh, possibly employee health screenings. Some places will be doing fever checks and, and maybe some testing. TechCrunch reports that some country companies will even look at overhauling their air filtering and circulation, uh, implementing sensors that determine how many people are in a room to make sure that it's not over the new capacity, and uh, putting markings on the floor to control movement around the office. Cameras might be up that monitor compliance. Some 
are even considering putting in robots to patrol the buildings and do cleaning like the we've seen some robots doing with ultraviolet in hospitals. So, I mean, this you know, is going to sound real obvious to say, but uh, no matter what, even when we all come out of the lockdown, as as countries and cities are reopening around the world, the office is going to be different. Very different. Um, it's it's going to be very very different, and I think that a lot of folks are not going to go back. But you know, as this article is saying, there's going to be some people who just the nature of their job requires them to be um, in an office. So you're going to see a lot of differences uh, in the way you used to work, um, probably middle of March going back, and how you will work, let's say, June going forward. It's just going to be a different beast of how you interact in an office. Well, I think a lot of, you know, these the details about, okay, how will the office environment work okay to make everyone safe when we come back to it? In some cases, okay, well, we're going to have to, you know, make sure you pull out some some desks so that nobody's too close to each other. Maybe there's, you know, yeah, staggered hours. All of that makes sense. But there are also certain physical places where the company's going to be like, you know what, this is a wash. This is this. Let's close it down. Let's figure out where to open it up in the future. Not everybody's going to work from home. I mean, in some cases, maybe everybody will. But most of the time, let's reimagine this because you're not just going to like pull out an HVAC and be like, well, let's make everybody safer. Like in, in many ways, I think that open op office office atmosphere is kind of uh, maybe, you know, should have died a long time ago. I do imagine that, uh, especially for you folks out in California, that outdoor meetings are going to be an all-time high in the second mm -hmm. half of this year. Mm -hmm. Unless it's too hot, right? <laughs> that would be <laughs> that would be the only reason. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a really good really good point. Uh, companies are going to have to adapt in lots of different ways, and 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 I think you're both right. Uh, it's going to be an evaluation case by case. Obviously, Twitter's not going to have their data center employees working from home uh, if they're meant to be swapping out RAM and, and stuff like that. You need maintenance people on site. Uh, so so that's, that's going to continue. But where companies have the opportunity, they probably will do a lot like cul-de-sac and say, look, it's $25,000 a month for an eight-person office in San Francisco that we now have to spend extra money to pandemic-proof. Uh, we can't put as many people in that same amount of space as we used to. We can't uh, we can't have you know the the same kind of situation uh, as as far as amenities uh, that we used to. We have to safeguard food uh, and all of the costs to adapt to that. Even you know just some smaller costs like bringing in masks and everything may be enough for a company to stay. We'd rather spend that money helping people build up their their home work offices. And you see that Slack just increased their allotment from five hundred dollars to uh, to an extra thousand, so fifteen hundred dollars to help people build out their workspace at home. Twitter's giving people a thousand dollars, as we mentioned earlier this week. Uh, a lot of companies have that kind of stipend to say, "Look, the money we're saving on not running the office, we're going to use some of that to help you build out your home office." And then once you've done that, I mean, there aren't a whole lot of ongoing maintenance uh, issues there. Maybe you give people a break on their cell phone or internet on an ongoing basis, uh, but. Uh, a lot of companies are going to be doing a lot of cost analysis on that. I know, Sarah, you were talking about a friend of yours that that their workspace was essentially the size of a conference room, and that's just not workable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, the, the idea of like, well, it was a conference room, but a bunch of us were in there because that's where you know you could put the cubicles. You know, was is in in our previous world, like uh, eh, I don't know, it was you know close quarters. Now can't do it. Yeah, cannot legally do yeah. it. And that and I I know that a lot of people are sort of uh, nodding to the fact that there were a lot of configurations that were bad in the first place. Bad for people, you know, bad for comfort, bad for it, it, being able to you know stretch out and and feel comfortable. So. I, you know, I hate to say like this is a good thing, but imagining the physical workspace probably, you know, was what well, was a long time coming. I can tell you what I personally will not miss that uh, that open workspace where everybody just was kind of sitting right on top of each other with hated no it. barriers. You know, um, I hated that. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say it was a millennial thing because I think they hated it too. But somebody thought it looked cute. It looked good, <laughs> um, but. Uh, but yeah, that I, I will well, it was, be sad the whole to see thing those was, go away. It was supposed to be like we're all collaborating together. There's no, 
you know, walls between us type thing. That actually sucks. People need privacy, right. <laughs> even at work. Yeah, you can't force them into collaboration. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. for sure. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, if enough of these companies move people to work from home, reduce their office space usage, the price of offices go down, and then the companies that do need to bring people into the office uh, will will we'll be able to save some money on that and and possibly provide better benefits, better pay uh, for people as well. Hey, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. TechCrunch's Danny Crichton puts it this way, China wants to build and grow while America wants to design and buy. That's why the two have to work with each other. Uh, but there is a dispute going on to try to get the upper hand in that relationship that these two countries find themselves in. Uh, and over the past 24 to 48 hours, we've had several developments impacting that. Uh, the first, the U.S. has extended a temporary license that lets some U.S. companies, usually rural ISPs, continue to do business with Huawei to support equipment that they had already bought. That is now extended through August 13th. But the Department of Commerce has said this is the last extension. You need to figure your stuff out so that you don't need to work with Huawei after August 13th. The U.S. Department of Commerce also has increased restrictions of what can be traded with Huawei. In its words, and this is not mincing any words. Uh, this is from the Department of Commerce announcement to strategically target Huawei's acquisition of semiconductors. Uh, they're calling uh, acquiring semiconductors from non-U.S. companies a loophole. So the new rules require any company, foreign company, that uses U.S. chip-making equipment to obtain a U.S. license before supplying certain chips to Huawei or its affiliates. Huawei will need to obtain a license to receive certain semiconductors and use certain designs. Uh, if you're wondering how they can get away with that, well, most chip manufacturers worldwide rely on equipment produced by U.S. companies. The foundries may be in Taiwan or Vietnam or China, uh, but the companies like Applied Materials, LAM Research, and KLA that make the equipment used in those foundries uh, are in the United States. China, of course, not happy with this, is now uh, once again saying they are considering putting U.S. companies on its unreliable entity list. Uh, China has said this previously before there was a simmering down of this relationship. There was an agreement that is still in place uh, that was supposed to kind of calm all this. China now says it could launch investigations into Apple, Cisco, and Qualcomm and might suspend purchase of Boeing airplanes. Again, they're saying this. They haven't done it yet. They didn't do it last time. We'll see what happens this time. One of the companies caught up in this is TSMC. TSMC is a Taiwanese company. They have a lot of factories in China, and they get a lot of equipment and design from the United States. So they would be one of the companies that would have to stop supplying Huawei if they couldn't get a license. Interestingly, Taiwan's TSMC just announced a deal with the U.S. government to build a factory in Arizona to make five nanometer chips thanks to what it calls forward-looking investment policies from state and U.S. governments. In the past, TSMC has said they'd need subsidies. Uh, they're not coming out and out and saying they're getting subsidies, but they're certainly getting some kind of assistance from the state of Arizona and the U.S. federal government. Now, TSMC, uh, you may be forgiven for not realizing, already operates a foundry in the U.S. state of Washington in the town of Commas and has design centers in Austin and San Jose. So their TSMC is not new to the United States, but building a five nanometer chip plant uh, in the United States is a big deal. That That is uh, probably the most significant of their developments in the country. The Arizona plant will not start production of chips until 2024. So this is not something that's going to start bringing chips to U.S. to U.S. assemblers right away. Uh, but it, it, there, there's a lot of moves by the U.S. in this trade dispute, specifically in the tech sector, to try to uh, strangle Huawei. Uh, and whether this is being done to force China's hand in the broader trade conversation, whether it's just punitive to try to drive Huawei out of business because the United States government has made it very clear that they do not trust Huawei, uh, it's, you know, it's up to you to kind of decide what you believe. But the fact of the matter is uh, they are putting the pressure not only on Huawei at the supply source with semiconductors, but also putting the pressure 
on the entire Chinese system by going after some of its biggest contributors in TSMC. Well, I know a lot of uh, folks who have listened to our coverage of this as of late, uh, depending on the company, is like, okay, well, Apple's moving some chip production into Vietnam from China, or you know, there's some uh, U.S. Uh, production that seems to be lined up, even if it's in 2024. At least we're going in the right direction, right? Like, is that is that the is that the call? Is that the call right now to uh, if the U.S. and China are are <laughs> involved in a trade war for the foreseeable future? Do you get just get things out of China? Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Uh, certainly, it's a part of it. Uh, a larger part of it right now is the the supply chain disruption that happened because of COVID nineteen when China shut down. Uh, its factories in February, and companies realized that they had a lot more of their supply coming from one location. Uh, so I think that is the the near term instigator. But but certainly that background of a trade dispute was part of this. I don't know the TSMC thing seems to be more of a carrot in that situation of like, hey, here's another reason we might want to look elsewhere. Maybe we can get the U.S. to give us a break on taxes, uh, it, like TSMC got. Uh, the Huawei thing is very specific to Huawei, though. I don't, I don't know that that really has any effect on why what companies Apple would pick. Uh, that that would be the more the wider trade war uh, and the trade restrictions that that involve uh, things beyond just Huawei, because there's there's sort of two aspects of that going on. Yeah, I think that uh, you know you kind of hit it on the you know the nail on the head there. That it's, it's kind of two things happening at the same time. TMC was probably doing this regardless of whether or not the pandemic happened. Um, but also the pandemic is showing that eh, we might want to do a little bit more of this um, because we are so dependent, um, you know, on getting stuff from elsewhere. So um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, you can't just throw a foundry up in a, in, in, in a couple of months. These things take years, not not just to build the building and get the, you know, get the hardware and get the processing correct, but you've got to train the workforce that's actually going to do it. So these are decisions that have been thought long and hard about. Um, but I would not be shocked if we see, you know, an, another company or two or three or more um, to say, yeah, if we, we can get a tax break, let's see if we can't build something in the States. Might be beneficial to us. Joining the conversation in our Discord. If you've got thoughts on this or anything else, you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's do it. Mike from What Does Even Matter Because I'm Inside writes <laughs> in and from says, inside. That's funny. Yeah, <laughs> says, Your talk about tech firms potentially looking at hiring or incentivizing people outside of the Bay Area had me thinking. I'm surprised they haven't done this yet. Mike says the federal workforce is spread out all over the world and 100K doesn't go as far as everywhere, depending on where you live. That's why they include locality pay on top of base pay, depending on where you live. That said, I would not encourage tech firms to use the federal model. The cost of living is calculated on housing, groceries, utilities, fuel, etc. This seems logical. But in Washington, a one-bedroom condo is what a couple might to expect to live in versus Omaha, where it might be a two-bedroom home. Parking in large cities, very expensive, sometimes rare, making suburban living a different commute altogether. Groceries are a nice basis, but if you're a senior professional, the expense of small luxuries like going out to a restaurant should also be considered. Yeah, this is interesting. So I, I like uh, Mike saying, hey, what we do works, which is there's a base pay for a role, but there's locality pay if you live in an, ex an especially expensive area. And that seems to make sense. But Mike also is saying, but don't calculate that the way we do, because it doesn't always fit the location. And that's that's a good piece of information there as well. Thank you, Mike. And thanks to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Les, Frederick, Frederick Hubner, and James P. Collison. I'm sorry for laughing, but I took a peek at Len Peralta's art already, and I'm already laughing, so let's check it with him. <laughs> yes, Len, what have you drawn for us? Well, you know, um, I, I had the same sort of reaction that Sarah had when I saw the uh, Facebook buying uh, Giphy story. Um, and I thought I'd put it into uh, an image here. Um, 
Uh, if you guys are familiar with that one meme of the little girl making the weird face, um, mm. that's the that's the reaction I had when I heard about it. I was it's like, not me. <laughs> She's, just in case you were concerned, no, it's not me. <laughs> it's probably my favorite GIF of all time. I just use that constantly. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go out and check it out at my <laughs> online store at lenperaltstore.com, or you can get it right now at uh, patreon.com forward slash Len. Thank you, Len. Uh, thank you for the laughs. Also, I'm glad I was able to make you laugh. <laughs> you really did. I'm a little, I'm a little flummoxed. Uh, also, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us today. Rob, always so good to have you and let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Sure. I am uh, at Rob Dunwood on pretty much everything. So Instagram, Twitter, um, and you can definitely uh, get a hold of me over at the SMR podcast. That's where me and a couple other uh, guys do a weekly podcast about tech and other stuff. Yeah, folks, uh, I, I discovered the SMR podcast a couple of years back, and I'm so glad I did. So uh, go join Rob, Chris, and Rod over there. Uh, have a good time hearing another perspective on technology. And the person that tipped me off to that show is one Allison Sheridan. And we want to take a moment here uh, to congratulate Allison on 15 years of NoSillaCast podcasts Ooh. as of this weekend. Uh, so go take a listen and if you listen live on Sunday, give her a hearty congratulations on our behalf as well. Uh, Allison, of course, on the show uh, from time to time, a uh, huge friend of ours. Uh, so congratulations, Allison. Uh, go check it out, podfeet.com. And of course, you can support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. 15 years. We should all be so lucky. Congratulations, Allison and team. Our email address at DTNS is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Ant Pruitt as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>